We uh, have been talking about, you know, the big, the big picture has been roots, getting back to the basics of our faith. We've been going through the Sermon on the Mount for most of this year, talked about the Beatitudes, we talked about a lot of different things that uh, Jesus has for us, the life he wants us to live, the way he wants us to live and grow, uh, the basics of what it means to be a Christian. And we're, we've gotten to Matthew chapter 6, and we come to this passage uh, that, where Jesus himself just starts talking about giving. Talks about your finances. We've talked over the last three weeks about you, your finances, and the church. And uh, I understand, let me just say this, I understand, especially in times like these where it is a struggle, what I don't understand, I think I'll never understand, is why people fight so hard against doing what the Bible clearly says to do. You know, there are things that I don't like to do in my life. There are things that in my job or jobs that I don't like to do. But I know God has called me to them. And I know that if I'm going to honor him with my life, I've got to do the right thing. And I always, hmm, I don't know if I should say I struggle with it because I don't really struggle with your problems. Your problems are your problems. If I can help you out with them, I will. I'll share, you, share with you what the Bible has to say. So I don't struggle with your problems and your decisions. What I struggle with is the mentality of people who just say, I will not do this. I'm not going to do it. It's the right thing to do. The Bible says it's the right thing to do, and I'm just not going to do it. I think part of the reason I struggle with that is because I ask myself, why would people not want to be blessed? Why would they not want to live in God's favor? Why would you want to carry the load of life all by yourself? I have a savior. As Daniel said, there's a God in heaven. There's a God in heaven that does miracles. There's a God in heaven that meets my need. There's a God in heaven that guides my path. Listen, I don't know what's coming down the road. I don't know where God's leading everybody. I don't know where God's leading me. But I do know this. There is a God in heaven that cares about me. There's a God in heaven that knows me. He knows me personally. He knows me intimately. He knows me better than I know myself. And he knows what's best for me in my life. Therefore, if I'm going to serve that God who is in heaven that I say and I believe with every ounce of my being created all things. One of our boys came home this way. I think it was Michael came home this week and said uh, they found the oldest human being that's still on earth. And he's 600,000 years old. And I listen, we listened to him. And uh, once he was done, I said, Michael, I appreciate the fact that your teachers teach you that, but that's wrong. This earth is not more than 600,000 years old. The Bible says God created the heaven and the earth. And if we can't get behind that, see, this is where we go wrong. This is where we're going wrong as Christians, as the church. We are giving into what the world wants to teach us. We're giving into science. Well, I'm telling you what, I serve the God who created science. I serve the God who created all things and he created science. He created the brain that that scientist uses to come up with wacky ideas. He created the brain that those scientists come up with to mock his holy name. Why would I want to follow that lie? So we, in love, without anger, without mocking anybody, without putting, we corrected our son and said, listen, bud, that's what they teach you. And if they ask you on a test, if you want to give their answer, then you give their answer. If you want to be, uh, if you want to stand up for your faith, that's tough for an 11, to ask an 11 year old to do. Parents, don't put that all on your kid. Um, and you can answer the way you feel is right. I always felt no matter what class I was taking, no matter where I was, I'll give the answer that I believe is right. If they mark it wrong, they mark it wrong. Oh, well. As followers of Jesus, he's giving us clear direction. He's given us, giving us clear teaching. And today we're going to wrap up this series on giving. Like I said, we don't spend a lot of time on it. I don't beat people over the head with it. I don't try to guilt you with it. I just teach you what God has to say. And I just share with you what he has to say. And I open up my heart 
to share with you what God has shared with me and what he has taught me. Along the way, I'll share my personal testimonies with you. I believe in being open and honest about who I am. It's not easy. It's not easy being a pastor. It's not easy being a pastor's family. When you open yourself up, you make yourself a target and everybody feels the feels like they have the right to attack your family and attack you. That's fine. If that's what you want, that's cool. Uh, if you're picking on me, you're not picking on anybody else, right? So that's fine. But if you can get beyond that pettiness, then maybe, just maybe, we'll see what God has for us. And we'll see that He has called us to a life of service, which opens up a life of blessing. He's not asking you to do anything difficult. He's not asking you to go beyond what is possible. He's just simply saying, obey me and follow me. That's all he's saying. So as we wrap up this series on giving, understand, I'm not trying to pressure you. I'm not trying to guilt you. I'm just trying to share with you what God has for you. Matthew chapter 6, verses 1 through 4, if you'd stand with me as we read God's word, it says, Be careful not to practice your righteousness in front of others to be seen by them. Otherwise, you have no reward with your Father in heaven. So whenever you give to the poor, don't sound a trumpet before you as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and on the streets to be applauded by people. Truly, I tell you, they have their reward. But when you give to the poor, don't let your left hand know what your right hand is doing so that your giving may be in secret and your Father who sees in secret will reward you. You may be seated. I think one of the most powerful parts of that passage is that no matter what you do, we live in a time of recognition, right? We live in a time where everybody wants everything to be recognized. If you're on Facebook or Instagram or whatever other social media is out there, and uh, you, you know what I'm talking about. There are people who measure themselves by the likes they get, right? I'm popular because I have so many likes here. What's wrong? How many times... I know nobody in here would do this, but how many times have you know of someone who has said, well, I wonder why my quote, my friend didn't like my picture. Well, maybe, you know, maybe your friend wasn't on Facebook that day. It's possible. It's possible. So we live in an age of recognition. We live in a day and age where it's all about the individual, where it's all about self-care, where it's all about taking care of me. And if I have a, enough left after I take care of me, I will help other people. And that's contrary to what the Bible teaches. Jesus said, when you give, don't give for recognition. Don't give to be seen by other people. You give because it's the right thing to do. And whether anybody else sees it or not, whether anybody else sees what you're doing, and this doesn't just apply to money. This applies to every area of your life. If and no matter who sees you, no matter who sees what, if nobody sees what you're doing, how you're living, the struggle every day that you overcome to be faithful to Jesus Christ, he sees it. The Bible says, my father who sees in secret will reward you. Folks, let me, let me just tell you, I've... This has to be stripped down to brass tacks. That has to matter to you. If you are going to walk with Jesus in fellowship, I don't care what you've been through in life. We live in a victim society with a victim mentality, and that's crept into the church where it's all about self-help. Listen, I'm not a self-help guru. I'm not a life coach. I'm a pastor, okay? I'm a pastor. I'm a straight-up pastor. I'm not here to give you the secrets to unlocking whatever. I'm here to teach you what the Bible has to say. That has to be enough. Why does it have to be enough? Because that's how Jesus planned, that's how Jesus set things out. That's how he said things need to work. And as Christians, no matter what you've been through, no matter where you are in life, there comes a point in time where you have to say enough is enough. Self-pity, I'm done with it. Leaning on the fact that I had a horrible life and I can't, uh, I struggle to get over it. It has to be, you have to have, get to a point where you say enough is enough. I've got to move beyond this. I've got to move beyond it and I've got to start living life. 
for him. That's where we're at now. That's where we're at in this part of the series. If you're a fisherman, they'd say you either, you're either going to fish or cut bait, right? You're either going to get bit at my, one of my favorite movies of all time, Shawshank Redemption. Get busy living or get busy dying. We've got to finally come to a place where we say, okay, God, we're going to do business on this. Not just your finances, but everything in life. Now, when it comes to you and your money and the church, we've done the heavy lifting when it comes to the biblical case for true followers of Jesus to give financially in support of their local church. We've already talked about this stuff. We've covered the instigation or the reason for giving to the church. The fact is, my instigation, the, the reason that I brought to you that I believe you should be passionate about supporting New Life Church financially is because we live in the greatest mission field in the United States of America. We live in the, in the metropolitan area that has the greatest need of the gospel. Oh, you know, New York's bigger than us. Oh, you know, San Francisco is bigger than us. Oh, Los Angeles is bigger than us. Let's talk percentages, folks. There's more of our people. Our people! Your friends, your neighbors, your family. There's more of our people that are lost and dying and on their way to hell and don't care, don't know than anywhere else in this country. Listen, I've, I've got to be honest with you. I, I come up dry if that doesn't motivate you. If that doesn't at some point get into your heart and say, I need to care about that. I don't need to care about global warming or climate change, whatever they're calling it this week. I don't need to care about solar panels. I don't need to care about electric cars. I don't need to care about the election in November. Honestly, folks, we need to care about the lost. We need to care about our community because our community is dying and going to hell right before our eyes. If there's no better reason for you to get over your fear of giving. And I don't know what else to bring to you. But we've covered the motivation. In order for the ministry, this ministry, to continue providing a place of worship, fellowship, discipleship, and growth, those who benefit from the ministry should contribute to the ministry. This is biblical. We've also covered the motivation factor of kingdom giving through your local church. And I, let me just say that again, through your local church. I'm not a parachurch organization guy. I believe, every, I believe that Jesus Christ founded the church. He said, on this rock, I will build my church. The gates of hell will not prevail against it. He established the leadership of the church. He established them to establish the first local church, was, which was in Jerusalem. And from there, he told them to go out and establish other churches. He didn't say go out and establish organizations. He said, go establish churches because through the church is the way I will reach this world for, with, my, with my gospel. Now, there are principles for you as a business owner. There are principles for you as a worker. There's teaching for you as a husband and a wife, father and a mother in ways to raise your family and live your life. But most of the New Testament epistles are written to us as Christians and how to operate and function within a local church. In Malachi, the passage that we don't like to talk about, Malachi 3, it says, bring all your tithes and offerings into the storehouse, and that is your local church. I believe first and foremost that your giving for the kingdom of God should come to the local church. Listen, I go so far, I'm such a local church guy. I believe if you want to give a gift to something or somebody, I believe and in the name of Jesus, I believe you should give it through your local church. Not so that we get a cut of it. That's not what it's all about at all. I believe that God's plan, and you can disagree with me on that, that's fine. God's plan is for you to reach the king, reach his kingdom and reach people through the local church. 
That's, that's, I, and I'm, I'll stand on that. That is a place Aaron and I talk quite a bit about, about battles to fight and where to plant our flag. When it comes to, uh, when it comes to the mission of Christians, I believe it's local church. 100%. I wouldn't be here if I didn't. So, we've covered, we also covered the motivation. Giving through your local church. The fact that you need to have a purpose for giving to your church. We saw a few biblical reasons to give last week. You're financially giving, any giving of any kind, your service. You want to be here on October 15th? Listen, I, be, I once again, I believe that should be a priority. I grew up doing these things. When we, when we bought this property back in 19, bought it in 70, late 76 or 77, late 1976. Man, we spent Saturdays here. That was before... Um, for crazy cable TV that was before uh, social media, before computers that was before cars that was before all kinds of things, man. And we were we were living over on Strong Street in Springfield, and we drove over here and we worked, we worked. And that was what we did. I've grown up doing that. That was a priority. The ministry of the church was a priority. Not just of my dad, not just of my mom, but of our family. Serving God in our church, that was a priority. That's what I've tried to pass on to my children, all eight of them. That church is a priority. So don't look at October 15th. If you look at October 15th as a burden, as you'd, something you'd feel guilty of for not being here, you know what? Eternally speaking, you should just stay home. Because you're not going to be blessed by God. That would qualify as, I'm just doing this to be seen by people. Amen. So what you should do is say, hey, God, I can give you Saturday. I can give you Saturday, God. That's not, that's just my reasonable service. I'll be there. I could give you an hour. I can give you half an hour. You know what? Some people, you may just be able to swing by and say, hey, guys, I've got obligations, but I just wanted you to know I'm praying for you. Praying that you'll, get th- you'll, you'll be able to do stuff today and that God will bless you in what you're doing. You see, it's all head mentality, but especially heart mentality. Not only is, does giving honor God, giving is the obedient thing to do. Giving is obedient. We're told to support financially. So if you aren't, uh, here we go. Not trying to guilt you, just trying to be honest. If you do not financially support the, the kingdom of God through your local church, guess who's not being obedient to God? The opposite of obedience, Cliff, I think if we looked that up, the opposite would be rebellion, right? So that was just a conversation between me and Cliff. I'm sorry if anybody else heard that. but. Not only is giving the obedient thing to do, but giving is the right thing to do. Giving to your church financially is the right thing. Listen, I don't give because I'm the pastor. My wife and I don't give because we're the leading family and leading couple of this church. That's not why we give financially. Quite frankly, there's other things I could do with my money. But there's nothing better I can do with my money. There's nothing of more eternal value that I could do with my money. When I think about a windfall that may come my way someday. Let me tell you what we talk about. We talk about what we could do for this church first. Because that's where our hearts are. Not this church. The kingdom of God. The last part of deciding to financially support the kingdom of God through your local church is this. Calculating your level of giving. Quite honestly, I've given you the reasons. I've given you the biblical argument for giving. I got nothing else for you on that, on that part. If you haven't been convinced by now, then I'll just pray, continue to pray that God will open up your mind and your heart and you'll see that it is the obedient, it's the right thing to do, and it's the way God's going to bless you and your family. I have five children that we're supporting. I have a wife that we're, we're meeting, we're facing life together. Man, I am not going to face life without the, the, the blessing and the favor of God on my family in that area. Just not going to do it. You want to recession-proof your home? 
You want to recession-proof your income? Give to the kingdom of God. I, my, my dad used to say, pray hardest when it's hardest to pray and give most when it's the most difficult to give. And I know it's tough, folks. Listen, I'm just stripped down honest today. You may notice that, right? You may notice that I'm just being honest today. And I know it's difficult. But you know what else I know? Even though the economy now sucks, and I'm sorry if that word offends you, but oh well. The economy sucks, and it's only going to get worse. Okay? You can't get water from a rock unless you're Jesus. Or Moses. <laughs> So there's going to come a point in time where you can't take much more from us. But God says, says, I'm not bound by the recession of your country. I'm not bound by the financial difficulties in this world. I'm not bound by the greed of men and women who think it's more important to line their pockets than it is to make sure everyone is taken care of. I'm not bound by anything. I can bless you no matter what. So that's my recession proofing of my family. I'm going to give to God. I'm going to give financially to my church and let him take care of the rest. That's just how I feel. And that's how I can, ar- I can argue that point with scripture. So we're going to calculate, we're going to give you some principles today about calculating your level of giving. Quite honestly, this is where most people get lost in the process or decide not to get involved. Why? Because the amounts that are presented to them is more than what they're able to comfortably commit to. And this is where I have conversations and maybe disagreements with other pastors, uh, other leaders, because our brand of evangelicalism uh, is storehouse tithing. A tithe is, the word tithe simply means tenth. And that's where we start from. I'll tell you what, depending on which poll you will listen to or look at, between 3 and 9% of all people who attend church regularly tithe. That's a losing argument. It's a losing argument. It just is. If I come to you and say, God's not going to bless you until you give 10% of your income, guess what? Most of you are going to say, most of you that aren't giving are going to say, well, I guess I'll just have to live life on my own because I can't, I don't have that level of faith. So let's just throw that out. Okay. Let's just not worry about the tithe, the word tithe, the 10%. Let's not worry about percentages right now. Okay. Because that's not where I'm coming from. I think God will bless someone more. Listen to this. Listen to this. Make sure those, make sure that camera is running so this gets on correctly. I don't want to be misquoted here. I believe God will bless you more if you put $5 in the offering plate with a true good heart towards his kingdom than if you walk in here with $50,000, drop it in an offering plate and say, look what I did. I'm the biggest giver in this church. I'm the most important person financially in this church. Worship me and my offering. See, I believe God will bless you more. I believe he'll take that $5. Watch this, Jeremy. I believe he'll take that $5 and he'll feed 5,000. Oh, I feel fair. Oh, where, where did you take economics? From, from the loaves and fishes 101. Right? Jesus took five, five biscuits. See, we, when, he say, when we say five loaves, we think like a loaf of bread. Well, that's not a loaf of bread, man. I, we go over to Big Y. My wife asks me why I, I buy these things. But I love, I love cornbread. I love corn muffins. Anybody love corn muffins? I love corn muffins. I like to put, I like to open up. I don't use cream corn because that's just gross. But I, when I make corn, corn muffins, I'll make the batter, and then I'll take a can of corn, and I'll dump a can of corn in there. So there's corn in, it's not just cornmeal, it's corn, okay? That's what I like. It grosses my wife out, but, I, listen, I had, I had my stomach cut out for a reason, right? Because I'd eat all the corn muffins on my own with lots of butter. So this kid 
wasn't walking around with five loaves of bread and two, uh, two big, um, you know, swordfish. He had, he had five biscuits and two fish. And Jesus, the master mathematician, Jesus, the master economist, took five biscuits and two fish and fed. Now, in the, in the New Testament, in, in those day and age, that day and age, they counted men. They didn't count the women and children. So there were 5,000 men there and then the women and children. So it's possible that it could have been, it, it was probably well over 10,000, maybe over 20,000 people that Jesus fed with five biscuits and two fish. So yeah, I think if you put, if you come to God and say, Lord, you know that this is a step of faith for me. This is a huge step. I, I have trust issues, especially when it comes to a church, especially when they start talking about money. I have problems, Lord. You know that. But I am going to trust you and take you at your word that you're going to first take this money and use it for your kingdom. And secondly, you're going to provide for me and protect me and take care of my family, even though we're making this sacrifice. Listen, I know I've, I've talked pretty bluntly and boldly so far this morning, but please don't, please don't ever think that I don't understand that what comes into this church, whether it's electronically or in the offering plate or when the giving box, when we put that up, please don't misunderstand me. I know that's a huge sacrifice. I just happen to be a guy that has never made a heck of a lot of money in life. So when I see $10 and I have children, I think there's a couple gallons of milk and some bread, right? Any of you, you don't have to raise your hands, but any of you live there with me? I, I see that, man. I see, I, I see the value. I don't have, I don't usually have $10 to just throw away. I don't have $100 to just throw away. I definitely don't have 10% of my income to just throw away. So when I give to this church financially, I do so not because it's my duty, not because I'm afraid of what God's going to do to me if I don't. I give financially to this church because I want his covering and his blessing and his favor on my family. I know these are difficult times, but I believe to recession-proof your home, <laughs> to recession-proof your, your family, give to God first. So let's not talk about percentages or fixed amounts. Let's talk about faith because that's what true giving is all about in its heart. And because you can understand the need and the motivation, you realize the biblical challenge and command to give financially to your local church. The next logical step is to determine the amount that you can faithfully commit to because that's what it's truly about. We're not talking about a one-time gift. We're talking about faithfully committing to giving to the work of Jesus Christ. That's what today is about. No guilt, no shame, no excuses, just a step of faith between you and God. How do you come to that point of decision? What are the biblical principles that come into play that will help you make an honest, informed, and biblically responsible faith decision? I want to share a few facts with you. It's not that difficult. We're not going to go deep, man. We're not, going to, we're not getting into a deep theology today. I'm going to give you some basic principles that I believe are enough for us to at least start. So some calculated, uh, some, some facts about calculating giving. giving. Calculated giving understands this. The first thing you must understand is this. Everything you have is a gift from God. Everything you have is a gift from God, from the air you breathe to the money that you earn. Oh, no, 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 no. I work for that money. Okay. Who gives you the air to breathe? Who gives you the strength in your muscles? Who gives you... And listen, if we believe the Word of God, if, you, if, you follow, if you're following the Wednesday night deeper uh, Bible study, you'll know that this past Wednesday night we talked about uh, from the from the Colossians chapter one, we talked about Jesus. We're getting into a little theology there, and we said Jesus is the Creator God. Not only did He create all things. Listen, I don't I don't just reject evolution. I reject theistic evolution. Biblically, theistic evolution is simply this: God created everything, and then He just left it to natural purposes. Okay, I believe there is an element 
that where God says we are given stewardship over things, but I can't create oxygen. I can't. Uh, I, I can't allow. I, I can't allow animals to continue to uh, to pump blood through their veins. I, we got a new puppy this week, Lala. She's amazing. She's a she's a holy terror, but I love her. She's uh, she's she's crazy. She's already crazy big for a four month old puppy. When she stands up. She lo- almost looks me eye to eye. But I think th- this little girl was less than 24 hours away from death. She was in a kill shelter. She's beautiful. I mean, if you've seen the pictures of her on Facebook, she's got beautiful blue eyes, man. She's just a beautiful dog. She's supposed to be Great Pyrenees, uh, Australian Shepherd and Hound, but she looks 100% Hound with Australian Shepherd eyes. She's just a beautiful dog. She's going to be enormous, which is what I love about her. She's going to be big. She already just jumps over the couch. She, yeah, she, I mean, she's just, she's, a, she's wonderful. You know, what I, you know what I know about, you know what I'm learning about Lala in less than a week? Somebody beat this dog. Because every time I go down to try to pick her up, because she's, she may or may not have slept in our bed. A couple nights, a few nights this week. May or may not have. I'm not quite sure. Okay. But she can't quite jump up on the bed yet. So when I reach down to help her, she starts yelping and she cowers away from me. That's not natural for a four-year-old puppy. Four-month-old puppy. I'm sorry, four-month-old. So while I can't... You know, I, I can't take care of the biological processes that keep her alive. I am responsible to take care of her. I can hurt her or I can help her. And that's the, that's the position we're in as human beings. We can either hurt or help God's creation. And I believe we're hurting it pretty badly. That's just my belief. Sorry, those of you who, on the right who deny a lot of stuff. But look at Florida. Man, it looks like a stinking atomic bomb exploded down there. Uh, getting worse than it used to be. I believe that's all prophesied. That's my take on it. But if I can't create things, God said it had to come about somehow. And the Bible says that Jesus is the creator God. And it doesn't just, just, doesn't just say that he created all things. It says everything exists through him and by him. Okay. So that's why I reject theistic evolution. Theistic evolution saying that God created and and then everything just exists on its own. Natural selection, all that kind of stuff. I reject that. That's ridiculous in my view. I'm sorry if you agree with that. We could sit down and I'll, I'll, listen, you could talk about Darwin. You could talk about all these people. I don't care. Okay. I've got the Bible. That's, that's the bottom line for me. Okay. So God is in charge of everything. God keeps everything going. Jesus Christ is the creator God. Everything, including the breath in your lungs and the strength to get up and work, the desire to go to work, the family he's brought brought to you, everything you have is from God. We may not acknowledge it. Most of the world doesn't acknowledge him. But for those of us who do, we're promised a blessing. We're promised his help and his protection and his covering as we follow his way. Second thing thing is God tells us in his word that everything we do, we need to do for his glory. Everything we do, we need to do for his glory, including supporting our church. There are a few things that we must consider and act on in order to fully understand kingdom giving. This is all talking about kingdom giving being calculated. First of all, kingdom giving requires plant, uh, planning and honest consideration of hard questions. A few of these I didn't print out in my sermon, so I'm going to have to turn to them. Luke chapter 14, verses 28 through 30, reads like this. For which of you wanting to build a tower doesn't first sit down and calculate the cost or if he is uh, to, or to see if he has enough to complete it? Otherwise, after he has laid the foundation and cannot finish it, 
all the onlookers will begin to ridicule him, saying, look, this man started to build and wasn't able to finish. Jesus doesn't just say, make a rash decision. Just listen to what the pastor has to say and just act on it. That's not what he says. He says, I've given you a good mind. I've given you the ability to process and think. I've given you the ability to reason and understand. So what I want you to do is take what you hear and sit down and consider it. Consider if you have enough within you, not enough money, but if you have enough within you, enough faith, enough commitment, enough love, if you have enough to to see it through, to finish it. See, we're not talking, like I said, we're not talking about a one-time thing. We're talking about a commitment for the rest of your life in supporting the kingdom of God financially. That's what we're talking about. Next Sunday, we have uh, missionary John Bergen is going to be here. Most of you have never met John. Uh, he's, we've been supporting him for almost 20 years now. Uh, him and his wife have been uh, missionaries to Scotland. They're going to be going back soon, and uh, he had this date open. And uh, he's coming up, and he's going to share his ministry. John's a Texan. He's a big Texan. Probably be maybe along your size, pretty close. A little, little rounder, but don't tell him I said that. John's a good guy. So no matter what, everything we do is for the kingdom of God. And we need to sit down and consider whether or not we have enough commitment and faith to see it through. So that's the first, the first thing. David Livingstone said, Don't th- do not think me mad. It is not to make money that I believe a Christian should live. The noblest thing a man can do is just humbly to receive and then go amongst others and give. Some questions I think we should ask ourselves when it comes to giving. The first one is this. Is this cause worthy of my investment? I believe we've covered that. Listen, I can stand before you honestly, passionately, without question, and tell you that I believe New Life Church is worthy of your financial investment. I believe what we, he- what we do here lines up with the Word of God. I believe what we do here matters for the kingdom of God. We're not the biggest. We're not the most popular. We don't have the the fanciest, newest building. But I believe we have people in our church who have hearts for God. We're not perfect. We're not perfect people at all. We have struggles. We have difficulties. We have issues. We all have lives that, uh, that require prayer, right? But I believe what we do here is not a social club motivated so that we can be popular. I can say that because I'm the pastor. Somebody else becomes the pastor, I can't vouch for that. But I can tell you this, I believe with all my heart that this church is attempting to do the right things for the kingdom of God and to reach our community for the kingdom of God. I believe the people we have, the decisions we make, are motivated to do the right things for the kingdom of God. So that's the first question you have to ask yourself. Is it worthy of my investment? Investment. Adrian Rogers said, it's what you plant that multiplies, not what you keep in the barn. Answering the question, is this worthy of my investment, asks another question. What can I afford to give and sustain for the long haul. You see, this is why many people get turned off at tithing. Because, first of all, 10% of my income, Pastor John, do you know how much that is? Yep, it's 10%. It's one out of every $10. I get it. I understand it. I understand it. I also understand this. I accepted Jesus Christ when I was about five years old. Now, if we are to believe calendars and time to be true, that was about 55 years ago. I'm not quite sure if I can trust that, but thank you very much for the whistle. Appreciate that. I'll be 60 in December. I understand completely and totally what this life is about. 
the life we're talking about. I get it. I've lived this way all my life. My dad was in the Navy when I was born. My dad retired from the Navy when I was nine years old. My dad became a pastor when I was nine years old. First church he pastored was in Pennsylvania, Cochranville, Pennsylvania. It's as small as it sounds. The head deacon had two sons that were members of the pagan motorcycle gang. That was a real treat, let me tell you. We had a football game to go to on Friday night. Eric was Eric and his team, Eric and the Spartans, were playing. Thank you, Eric. They were playing um, Wakona Regional High School. Anytime it has regional in the name, you know you're going into the middle of nowhere, right? That's what we did. We went up, we drove up. And we, I set the, I set the GPS, I was telling a couple earlier this morning. I set my GPS on my phone for Wakona Regional High School. Somehow, I don't know how, but somehow that got changed to Berkshire County. I don't know if it chose the highest point of elevation in Berkshire County to take us to, but that's exactly where we went. We went so far into the, into nowhere that we drove past this All I can say is it was a compound and a sign proudly proclaimed Hells Angels Motorcycle Club, Massachusetts chapter. I said, well, we might want to get away from here. And we drove a little farther and there was the back entrance that said, Hells Angels, keep out. So we did. (laughs) And we kept driving and the pavement ended and we passed a sign that said, these roads are not maintained in the winter. And we kept going. And we, and we kept going. And then, I have no idea, but there were cages in the pond. These big cages. I don't know if they were put there by the forestry department or the Hells Angels. I don't know. All I know is I didn't want to be in them. Right? And we just drove and we drove. And if you've ever seen the movie RV with Robin Williams, right, that was us. We got to, you know the, the, the part where he's driving the big rolling vehicle. <laughs> okay, he's driving the RV up to the top and he gets to the peak and he kind of balances and then has to go. We got to a point, no lie, we got to the point in the road where we got to the top and you couldn't see beyond it. I was like, what's going to happen now? And we got over it and it was just down. It was crazy. It was absolutely crazy. But we got there, we got to the game and East Long Meadow won. Just put, put that out. And I forget where I was going with that point, so we'll just move on to the next. It was a great story, though. It's a great story. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. My dad's first church. He was was in Cochranville. And then then my dad resigned that one. See, that's why I've got a young wife, because she has a good memory. I don't. I've got all the replacement parts. You know, she carries the toolkit. My dad's second church was in Bel Air, Maryland. He was the pastor of Bel Air, not the prince of Bel Air. Wiggy, wiggy. DJ, DJ, DJ Johnny, yep. And then he was called up here. I was, I think I was 13. And I've lived this life my entire life. So I get it. I get that I don't, un- many of you came to Christ as adults. You do not have the foundation. I'm, I'm not saying this arrogantly. Please don't misunderstand me. I'm very proud of, I'm very proud of the heritage of my family. I truly am. For some people, it's a turnoff that we have four generations of chases in this church now. To me, I think it's the greatest example of what God can do with a family you can find. I truly do. I mean that with all my heart. We are, and, and if you were to go beyond my, my mother and father, you will find that my grandfather, Ted Chase, was uh, a, he, he was a superintendent of Sunday school, I believe, in his, in his church, and he went around and preached in other churches. And you go back, and uh, you'll find that one of my great-grandfathers, not sure how many generations, was a circuit-riding preacher throughout Massachusetts, New Hampshire, and Maine. So it goes back. There's a heritage that has been passed down in my family. I'm proud of that. But I also understand that many of you came to Christ later in life. So you don't have that foundation that I, do, that I do. You don't have the examples that lived before you to see that this does work. 
So I understand that the steps you that I'm asking you to take, steps that I'm, I'm sharing with you from the Bible, I understand they're difficult steps to take. Please, don't misunderstand me. I'll, I'll not point her out, but I'll, I'll use Aaron as an example. Aaron came to Christ at the age of 36. Okay? I'll say this too. She came to Christ at 36, so cut her some slack. Okay? Don't expect her to be um, your perfect pastor's wife. Uh, cut her a little slack because she didn't know Jesus for 36 years. More, she didn't know Jesus longer than she's known Jesus. Okay? So if you want, if you want a break in your life, give my wife a break in hers, okay? Stop expecting more from her than you do of yourself. I'm, did I say that out loud? I'm sorry. Sorry. Anyway, so I understand, man. I get where you're coming from. I get it completely. I get it completely. But let me say this with love. It doesn't excuse you from the clear teaching of the Word of God. And you still have to deal with this question and this issue. So we need to be honest about it. You want to know why I'm being stripped down and honest this morning? That's exactly why. Because it's not about being, it's not about flowering and powdering everything up. It's about bare bones, rubber to the road, brass tacks. What are we going to do? 1 Corinthians 16, 1 and 2 says, Now about the collection for the saints, do the same as I instruct the Galatians church. On the first day of the week, each of you is to set something aside and save in keeping uh, with how he is prospering so that no collection will need to be made when I come. You need to ask yourself this, how far can my faith stretch right now? Right now. If you shudder at the thought of 10%, your faith isn't going to be able to stretch that far right now. Don't try to make it. Ask yourself honestly and, and talk with God. This is, a, this is a community discussion between you. If you're married, you, your spouse, and God. If you're single, between you and God. Have that communication. Have that conversation. How far can my faith stretch now? I remember one couple I knew. I used to work with a guy at CF. He was a truck driver. Him and his wife accepted Christ late in life. And they started giving, ten, I think it was $10 a week. $10 a week. You'd have thought those people put in a million dollar check into the offering with how happy they were that they were contributing. They weren't bragging about it. They, weren't, they were just so thankful that they, first of all, had the opportunity to give and secondly, felt good in their hearts about what they were doing for the kingdom of God. How much can I do how far can my faith stretch right now? And we're going to, uh, you can read those, those passages on your own. Third thing, how can I show generosity in giving financially to my church? Remember, that's one of the, that's one of the characteristics that should be, that, that's one, one of the things that should be characteristic of our giving. Generosity. How can I show generosity in giving to the kingdom of God through my local church? Next point I think we should ask ourselves or make, uh, about kingdom giving is this. Kingdom giving understands that giving to the church is building wisely. Giving financially to the church is building wisely. Our books are open. You, the only thing you can't see is who gives what. The only person who sees who gives what is Cliff Nurse right up here. He's our deacon over financial uh, matters. He's the only person that knows who gives what. We do that intentionally. As I've said many times, I don't know how much you give. I don't know if you give. I don't want to know. Okay? I, don't, I have no desire to know anything about that because I want to be able to, because I'm human, and I want to be able to treat everybody equally. And I don't want to have the temptation to come in to, uh, to treat people differently who give more so that they'll continue to give more. That's, that, and that's just straight honesty. But you can see where we spend our money. In fact, if you're a voting member, you have, a, you have an, uh, a voice in that every January when we make up the budget. Kingdom giving understands that giving to the church is building wisely. A.W. <clears throat> Tozer said this, as base a thing as money often is, yet it can be transmuted into everlasting treasure. It can be converted. Listen to this. Listen to how Mr. Uh, Reverend Tozer talks about 
what your financial support of the church can be. It can be converted into food for the hungry, clothing for the poor. It can keep a missionary actively winning lost men to the light of the gospel and then transmute itself into heavenly values. Any temporal possession can be turned into everlasting wealth. Whatever is given to Christ is immediately touched with immortality. Wow. Whatever is given to Christ is immediately touched with immortality. See, this isn't just giving something away that you aren't going to miss. This is giving with a purpose, an eternal purpose. Kingdom giving, lastly, kingdom giving makes a decision and sticks with it. Kingdom giving makes a decision and sticks with it. Billy Graham said, there's nothing wrong with people possessing riches. The problem comes when riches possess people. Randy Alcorn said, God prospers me not to raise my standard of living, but to raise my standard of giving. You will find a level of comfort and agreement between you and God on your level of giving if you do it prayerfully. This is your moment of calculation. When you, you understand what instigate, you, you've been instigated into investigating giving. You've seen a purpose, a reason for giving. And now you want to know what you should give consistently and faithfully on a regular basis. I mean, you need to talk to God. You need to talk, you and your spouse or you on your own, you need to talk to God. And you need to come to a decision between you and him. Not, what, not necessarily what you're comfortable with, but I believe what will stretch your faith. <clears throat> Second Corinthians 9, 6 through 8 says, The point is this, the person who sows sparingly will also reap sparingly, and the person who sows generously will also reap generously. Each person should do as he has decided in his heart, not reluctantly or out of compulsion, since God loves a cheerful giver. And God is, is able to make every grace overflow to you so that in every way, always having everything you need, you may excel in every good work. This will require prayer. It will require meditation. And meditation is not sitting there with your legs crossed, doing stretching exercises that mimic uh, animals, which is a, a uh, pagan form of religion with your fingers like this saying, Om. Meditation is simply thinking with a purpose, man. Meditating on the word of God, thinking with a purpose. God, I want to know what you have for me. I want, I want to know. I want to get this matter settled. When you have calculated the cost of giving your offering, the action of giving will come naturally. You will continue to give to completion. Luke 6, verses 36 through 38, I've always loved this passage. The Imperials, old Christian rock band, sang the song, Cast Your Bread Upon the Waters. Those of you who are a little older may remember that. And it comes from this passage. Be merciful just as your Father also is merciful. Do not judge and you will not be judged. Do not condemn and you will not be condemned. Forgive and you will be forgiven. Give Now listen, just, Jesus just naturally transitions into these things, right? He says, don't judge. And we all want to jump on that one, right? Don't judge me. Only God judges me. People wear t-shirts with that. Only God judges me. Well, maybe you should let him, okay? Because, man, you're on the wrong path, right? Don't judge and you won't be judged. Don't condemn and you won't be condemned. Forgive and you will be forgiven. And then he has the gall to say this, give and it will be given to you. And he goes on and elaborates about what will be given to you. He says, give and it will be given to you, good measure, pressed down, shaken together, and running over will be poured into your lap. For, the for with the measure you use, it will be measured back to you. Do you understand this? This hit me one day when I was studying this passage. I determine my level of blessing. You get that? I determine my level of blessing. If I want to be blessed, now I don't determine how God, how much God blesses me. I don't determine what he does and how he blesses me. But I determine the level that uh, my level of blessing. If I want a little blessing from God, then I give a little bit. If I want a medium blessing from God, then I'll go a little bit farther. 
But if I want God's full blessing on my life, I'll give everything I have to him. I'll consider everything he's given to me. When I pay my mortgage, I don't pay my mortgage saying, oh, look at what John and Aaron did. We did all of this so that we could we can own this home. I, when I pay these bills, no lie, man. Jeremy, I'm telling you the truth. When I pay my bills, I say, thank you, God, for providing for my family. Because quite honestly, I don't know how he does it. I don't know how we make those payments every month. I don't. And maybe you're in that same boat. But I know that the more I give to him, the more he's going to bless me in return. I determine my level of blessing. Listen, I want all of God. I want every bit. I don't know where he's going to lead me. I don't know what he's going to do with me. I don't know anything about that. But I know this, no matter where I go, no matter what I do, I'm going to go with him and do what he wants me to do. If he called me today to leave New Life and move my family to Puerto Rico, I would do it because it's God's, God's plan. And I know that God would go with me and he would bless me there. You see, the position of pastor at this church is not what determines my self-worth. It's not, how, not what I consider. That's, it's not my, how I draw my personal value. I'm a child of God. I'm a follower of Jesus Christ. So I know no matter what he does with me, no matter where he leads me, he's going to bless me as long as I'm following him. It takes a long time to get, it, it, takes, it takes some steps of faith, not patting myself on the back, it just takes some steps of faith to get to that point, but you don't get there unless you take the first step of the journey. Kingdom giving isn't a burden or a curse, it's a challenge to stretch your faith and prove that you can trust God. Kingdom giving is a sign of growth to maturity as a follower of Jesus. Listen, wrapping this up, what kingdom giving ultimately comes down to is this. Do you want your life, your entire life, your entire life to make a difference for eternity? God asks each of us to take a look at our lives at what he's blessed us with. And he asks us to give it to him. Not to make him feel good about himself. Not so that you can seen, be seen admired by others. Not so that you can brag to me about what you do for this church. But so that you may have the opportunity to make a difference in this world, to make a difference in the lives of others, and make sure that you're walking in the favor of God. And that's the name of that tune. Would you bow your heads with me in prayer? And while every hat is bowed, every eye is closed, I wonder if you would just, just be honest for me. Nobody's out is looking around. It's just you, me, and God. And I said, I'm not, it's not high pressure. I'm not even going to ask you to raise your hands. But I would just simply ask you this question. Has something spurred a feeling in you, in your spirit, to do something about this? Has something we've talked about, something that's been said, a verse we've read, a point that's been made, has it done something to spur your hunger and thirst for righteousness in the area of giving financially? Listen, we'll cover the rest of Christian living as we continue on, but we're talking about you, your money, and the church right now. Don't let that go, don't let that pass without doing something about it. Husbands and wives, have that honest, hard conversation. Single people, Spend some time praying and meditating on that and seeing what God wants you to do for his kingdom. And then make a decision and then follow through. I promise you, with every ounce of my being, God will meet you at your decision and he will bless you. I promise you, according to the word of God, he will bless you. Lord, thank you so much for the privilege of being in your house, for the privilege of being able to call you Lord and Savior. Lord, I know that what we've talked about the last three weeks is very difficult. It's a difficult topic. It's a tough topic, and it's a sensitive topic. And I get it, Lord. I get it completely. I'm human. I understand that. Cool thing is, so do you. The Bible says that you didn't have a place to lay your head, a place to call your own, yet. 
you still fulfilled your purpose. Lord, I pray for those who are struggling with, with the giving aspect of, of walking with you. Father, would you spur them to have that conversation with you? Would you not let them go until they make a decision? And then would you give us the faith to follow through? Lord, I pray that you'll bless each and every one here. Bless us all in our decision making. Bless us all in, in the conversation. And God, would you bless this church? Bless this church financially, bless it numerically, but most importantly, God, bless us in the area of faith. Bless us in our walks with you. Bless us with opportunities to share with people who need to hear about you. And may we honor you in all things, Lord. Your precious holy name we pray and ask it all. Amen.